Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. The class is mainly about Bhakti Vinod, but we'll do the text. Vayam Cha Sham Cha Ye Sime Tulya Kalas Characharaha Janma Mityor Yita Paskat Pran Naivam Adunapi Bog Fayur cha tiam cha me chime Tuya kalas chara chara Janma mityo yita paskat Rana naivam adunapi biog Ladies. I am, we, the great sages and the ministers and adherents of the king, Cha, and Tuam, you, Cha, also, Ye, who, Cha, also, and me, these, Tudya Kalyaha, assembled at the same time. Chara, acharaha, moving and not moving. Janma, birth, mityor, and death. Yatya, just as. Paskat, after. Prak, before. Na, not. Evam, thus. Atuna, at present. Api, although. Bo, O King. Translation purport by Divine Grace Hila Prabhupada O King, both of you and us, your advisors, wives, and ministers, as well as everything moving and non moving throughout the entire cosmos at this time are in a temporary situation. Before our birth, the situation did not exist. And after our birth, it will exist no longer. Therefore, our situation now is temporary, although it is not false. Please repeat. O King, both of you and us, your advisors, wives, and ministers, as well as everything moving and not moving throughout the entire cosmos at this time, 
are in a temporary situation. Before our birth, the situation did not exist. And after our birth, it will exist no longer. Therefore, our situation now is temporary, although it is not false purport. The Mayavadi philosophies, philosophers say, Brahma Satya Jagat Mitya, Brahman, the living being, is factual, but his present bodily situation is false. According to Vaishnava philosophy, however, the present situation is not false, but temporary. It is like a dream. A dream does not exist before one falls asleep, nor does it continue after one awakes. The period for dreaming exists only between these two. Therefore, it is, a, it is false in a sense that it is impermanent. Similarly, the entire material creation, including our own creation and those of others, is impermanent. We do not lament for the situation in a dream because the dream takes place or after it is over. And so during a dream, or during a dreamlike situation, one should not accept it as factual and lament about it. This is a real knowledge. On one morning walk, Srila Prabhupada was talking about this, how the seer is the same in a dreaming and an awake situation. And so when I heard that, we were walking on the upper beach in Venice in Los Angeles, and uh, it struck a note. I just, the seer is the same. So at the, when he said that, it was very mystical. I didn't know what he was talking about, being a brand new devotee. But the seer is the same in a waking and a dreaming situation. We are always present, but in a dreaming situation, uh, although it's temporary, this life continues, and what's the difference between a waking and a dreaming state? And Prabhupada summed it up very, very, uh, quite amazingly, is that in a waking state, we're just dreaming longer, we're awake longer. In other words, it's a continuum, that ultimately, uh, it's all temporary, the dream state and the waking state, it's all one continual. So, in this continuum, uh, whether we're sleeping or awake, ultimately, as a devotee, it completely turns around. That in a dreaming state, if you're dreaming of, many do, many dream of Prabhupada and the deities, uh, I've had many, and in that dreaming state, it's, it's taken as darshan, that actually you're getting a mercy full on from Prabhupada or from the deities. And I'll tell one story, it's really funny. This one dream, Prabhupada came in a dream, and he bust into the room in a dream and woke me up in a dream, and my wife. And so he says, time to get serious about your spiritual life. I may have mentioned this before, but it's funny. And so uh, then I woke up, wrote it down, all the details, and I went back to sleep. Again he comes. This time he's got a big marble plaque. You heard this story? <laughs> Anyway, on a marble plaque, it was inscribed, chiseled in Latin, big words. And so I looked at it, and I knew what it meant. So he said, Prabhupada asked me, do you know what this means? And I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada, I know Italian, it's almost like that. But what does it say? It says, get serious about your spiritual life. Again, chiseled in stone. And then he looked at me, and he says, he looked at the person to the side, and he said, he should get serious about his spiritual life, shouldn't he? I looked over and it's another Prabhupada, two Prabhupads face to face, telling me, get serious about your spiritual life. So from that point on, I tried my best. I've been trying to be serious. But in a waking state, now we have more opportunity to do service, but it's temporary. And we take it as like it's going to last forever. We think this life is never going to end. And we see around us, everybody popping off, all our famous God brothers now taking, taking their leave. And find many stories how, you know, just heard it recently, one story about this boy's, this devotee God brother's wife died. And so, in the, in the, in the interim, just after she died, she appeared to him and looked in the mirror, looked in the mirror, and she's talking to him, you can, you can hear the talk. And so she's 
in the spiritual plane. And so he'd look in the mirror. Well, he looked in the mirror, he saw himself, but he saw behind uh, there was this, this person. In any case, she gave some information about who's there. Uh, Jayananda's there, uh, all the big kirtan leaders are there, Vishnu John, Haridas, I mean, uh, they, she, he, he asked about uh, Jyot Haridas. Well, he's associate of Lord Chaitanya, he's there. And so, ultimately, the, the kirtan rolling on is that when we depart from this body, it's a joyous occasion. There's nothing lamenting about a person passing away because ultimately you go back home, back to Godhead. And Prabhupada's famous about this back door key. I don't know how big that key is, but it must be a big one to turn that back door lock. And so he has that for all the devotees that come into this new, uh, be a new development place in the spiritual world where there'll be a lot of senior devotees already living in their apartments. And uh, creep is one of them. Prophet said, you're given money to help build these big temples all over Mayapur, uh, Vrindavan, Bombay, he gave a lot of money. He says, while you're given money, uh, Krishna's building your house in the spiritual world. And then uh, Srab also, Maharaj at that time, he got the mercy also because he built the places. And I helped him with the samadhis here in, and in Vrindavan. In any case, his place is there. And so ultimately, we're all in a neighborhood. We're going to be friends in the spiritual world, living on the same street, maybe. And uh, I remember when I first, before I joined, I was living in New York City, right near Tompkins Square Park. And uh, Brahmananda lived in a few houses away, and, and Hansa, Hansa Duda was on that block. And we're all basically associates in different ways. We've come from strange, different backgrounds, but ultimately here we are together. And this is part of the dream, that actually we're here for a moment, this class ends and we all disperse, and another class starts, and another group will come. And so on and on it goes until perpetual time runs. So in, a, in this temporary situation, make the most of it. So as we are you know, working so hard to glorify the Lord, and whatever service we do is, is accumulative. It doesn't just, you know, like any work we do outside karmi world, ultimately it's just temporary, you get no benefit. But in the spiritual world, you get a lot of benefit. And so, um, this leads into Bhakti Vinod's life. And he's born 1838 in a small town, Uttal Nagar. And uh, his family died off really quick. And so he had brothers, and, and they died, and father, mother stayed alive, and one sister, and there was a cholera epidemic. They left. They went to Calcutta and survived. That It was a tumultuous disease and killed most of the villagers. And so his life went on. And so his maternal grandfather called him back, and he said, because he was about to leave the body, so these stories are famous, but I'll, I'll try to find new things. So the grandfather said, uh, when you turn 27, your life will be established and whatever work you're doing will be your lifetime occupation. And don't mess around here very long. Just get out of here. Don't stay in this town. When I go, you go. And so he did that. And sure enough, when he turned 27, he became a first district magistrate and a district collector. He had high post right from the very beginning, at very early age, at 27. So his life starts very quick like that. And apart from all the writings that he's, he wrote for 19 years in seclusion, he took a period of time away from his, his office duties, and he just wrote. Now, his schedule is something remarkable. He only slept two hours and 45 minutes, according to his schedule as written. And six hours in court, he did his job really fast, uh, six hours writing. So when he went to court, it was by carriage, but then they built that railroad that used to be across the, across the river. A small gauge train that used to carry, I remember when it was running. And uh, so he was very well placed and he moved around different positions. He kept changing uh, when there was difficulty. He had fever different times, but ultimately, uh, his life as a court judge uh, was very fast, 
obviously, you know, the Paramahansa, so he knew who's lying, who's telling the truth, and what judgment to make. But very fast. He did all his work quickly. In six hours, it was early in the morning, he, he, he'd take his breakfast. I'll get the whole schedule later. But then he'd come back for lunch one hour, and then he'd go back to office, and he'd stay till five and came back and start reading and writing again. And so uh, Prabhupada paralleled this, and he wrote very little. I mean, he slept very little, but he wrote incredibly, as we know. And this is the, the key, the Vaishnavacharyas. They leave their word. And so Bhaktivinoda's words ring really strong. And wait. I want to read the, the famous line that he gives all of, we hear all so much. Um, oh, for that day when the fortunate English, French, Russian, German, and Americans will take up banners and murdungas and cartels and raise kirtan to the streets and towns. When will that day come? When will fair-skinned men from, this, from their side will rise up the chanting of Jai Satyananda, Jai Satyananda, and join the Bengali devotees? Jai Satyananda, Jai Satyananda, Jai Satyananda. So here we are chanting Jai Satyananda and predicting the predictions well taking place. And he said that over the, in time, uh, there will be a personality who will soon appear that will take this message across the entire world. And he's the one that said it about Lord Chaitanya's prediction in every town and village. And so that prediction, uh, as we know, is very well placed now by Srila Prabhupada. So he was given an initiation by Bipin Bihar, who was known as the energy of the Lord. And so no small personality. But uh, his, his diksha came in that line, and that's uh, Janavi's line. But when he was in Vrindavan, he met his, his Shiksha guru, Chakanas Babaji. And so they struck it off very closely. And when, when he left, when Chakanas Babaji left, Bhaktivinoda kept his clothes, his coping and his top shoes, all the cloth he had. So when he retired to Puri, he took Babaji. And so for four years he was in, in Samadhi. And so those four years he was a Babaji and had the same clothes that Jagannath Babaji wore. And so uh, he had established a printing press in Calcutta along, uh, I guess not the same one that the son established. And so he was printing and he knew seven languages. Got it written here somewhere. Anyway, seven languages. And the printing press was at the Bhakti Bhavan, Calcutta. Then the famous story uh, about the, the location of the yoga pith. Now, before his time, everybody was suggesting that it was in Navadweep. And so it's a very detailed description about what happened. And so he, he went through all the early maps on Navadweep and he found out that Navadweep was only 100 years old at that time, established only 100 years before. So it couldn't be the yoga pit. Then from across the, across the river, he was looking over towards Mayapur. He saw one area way in the distance, and it was a fulgence, it was a big light coming. A very tall tulla tree was there, covered in what he found later a substance, very unusual. And so that was, proliferate of Tulsi's growing all around that area. The Muslims were afraid of it and they thought it was haunted. So they stayed away. And so this bore out to be exactly the location of Lord Chaitanya's birthplace. And so he brought Jagannath Babaji along in a basket to confirm it. And so as soon as Jagannath Babaji got to that spot, it said he leaped out of the, he couldn't walk, but he leaped out of this and jumped like four or five feet in the air and, and started, Jai Satchinanda, Jai Satchinanda, here we go again. And so he ultimately, uh, you know, confirmed that this was the place of Lord Chaitanya's birth. So then Bhaktivinoda took it upon himself as a mission to fulfill the prophecy of building a temple on that spot. So he collected and very humbly, you know, he's a very, at this point, very highly placed, very, a very, astute scholar, as we know, you know, a pure devotee, so he had nothing you know, small about him. 
He was a big man. And uh, so he went to his enemies' houses and knocked on the door. Now, please, some, some token, some, some, diff, some gift, some donation for this temple we're building. Now, Lord Chaitanya's birthplace. It has to be built. And so he collected the money, and the construction started. And when they were digging, they found uh, the Korma deity, and they gave it to his son to worship. And uh, so as they built the place, then there was the opening ceremony, and they were inviting all the English authorities at that time. And so he had set it up so that the English would have their meat and their wine and everything else, and that the devotees would have a separate kitchen. There was this Armstrong, a fellow that was an ambassador, one of the ministers from England. So remember, this is British time. So everything, all the placements were done through the British. So when Bhakti no took these big positions as district magistrate, that's next to the governor. So a very big high position in different places. And so he was even packing the chillums of these cooks that day for the opening to make sure everything went right and the cooks were doing their job. He went out of his way, bent over backward to make everything right, to give facility for this. And so they even named this school next to Yoga Pith in his honor, Bhakti Vinod School. And so the opening went well and God Save the King was a banner that was placed there. And, and so somebody joked and put a different name up there, Down with the King, or it was like, you know, Save the World. Any case, so that was a very important issue that happened. And then later, when he was in Puri, he was the district magistrate, and the king embezzled 80,000 rupees. Now, at that time, 80,000 rupees wasn't a small amount. And so he forced that king to make 52 offerings every day to compensate for that 80,000 rupees that he stole, or misappropriated. And so this didn't set well with the king. So the king at that time was, wasn't a very good person. And, uh, and so he set aside 50 pandas, and then secret, they were chanting these mantras to kill Bhakti Vinod. And so it went on for a whole month, for 30 days. And so at the end of the 30 days, guess what happened? Who knows? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, his son died. The only son of the king died instead of Bhakti Vinod. So be very careful about, if you take out your thread and you, you give it a whip ear and you start, you can't, it has a potency. But if you do it, sometimes it, it boomerangs, it comes back on you. And there's stories of devotees who are like, cursed each other to fall down and ultimately they both fell down. Very big name devotees, I won't mention their name. But in any case, don't do it. Don't think that you can get away with it. Not for this age. And then when, in 1896, uh, Bhaktivinoda wrote that book, Life and Teachings of the Precepts of Lord Chaitanya, sent to McGill University. One devotee went there and found the book. That actual book was there. He stole the book, and he, he gave it to Prabhupada. And Prabhupada, I think Prabhupada told him to give it back, you know. But that was the year of Prabhupada's birth also. And so Prabhupada talked about it. Who could know? Uh, at that time, that book was in the hands of Americans or Canadians. And so, and I took birth at that same time. Who could know that all you people, all you devotees here, all you my students would come? I had never expected all this. And Prophet kept saying that. He never expected the success that was happening when all the books were printed. And like now, it's in the millions of books. I read 500 million books been distributed since Prophet's time. So Bhakti Vinod's literary career had no limit. He was writing six hours every day, but he had that 19 year period where he just wrote continually and chanted. So in his career, uh, as he moved around, he, he wanted Krishnagar as his, as his home base. And, and he, when he built the, the ashram across the river, uh, from there he looked across and he saw you know, the plains of Mayapur, and it was empty at that time. And so I did a painting once, it was in one of the early Mayapur magazines, of Bhaktivinoda you know, looking across the Jalangi, and there appeared the domes. 
At that time, the samadhi was just starting. The dome wasn't up yet. So I painted in the different domes, and it was mentioned there would be golden domes by Lord Nityananda, and now we have it. So predictions are taking place that uh, we're now all the different nations have come together. It's like what Prabhupada says, the real United Nations is right here, you know, in this gun. Um, the schedule, let me just read about this amazing schedule he had. He got 8 p.m. to 10 o'clock he slept, two hours. He wrote till 4 a.m., took rest of a half hour, chanted Japa till 7, and he wrote letters and read for till 8.30, and 15 minutes rest. Uh, at 9.45, he took his bath, and by 9.55, 10 minutes, take his bath and take breakfast, which was just some, some milk and some cereal, juice, very light. Then he took his carriage, 10 to 1, he was in court, home by 2 p.m., so then returned to office. He was up to 1, then back to the office at 2 to 5. So 2 hours, 45 minutes, sleeping, six hours in court, six hours of writing. So a very prolific you know, understanding of, of how to use your day. And in the beginning, his first wife died when he was, when they were very young. He married a first, second wife, we had seven boys and three girls. But from the first wife, there was one boy. And he took his first teaching job. And then he started, it was a big deal to find out CC. So he was looking hard to find Chaitanya Charitamrita didn't exist. I mean, the book existed, but it, there was no copies. And finally, he did get one. So by that time, and when he got his first teaching job, then he started reading about Lord Chaitanya. Uh, two months after the first wife died, he even married, married Bhagavati Dasi. Then uh, 1861, he was reading fully the CC. So, uh, I mentioned this, that he spoke Bengali, Sanskrit, English, Latin, Urdu, Persian, and Orient. It doesn't say about Hindi. The fourth son was Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. Now when he was in my, was in Puri, he gave classes when he was, he was a district magistrate. He was a big person. But he was giving classes at Topa Gopinath in, in uh, Gambira and uh, different places in the Haridas, of course, Samadhi. And so, right across the street from the Samadhi, Haridas, he had his kuti. It was Bhakti Kuti, he called it. And so there he did his last writings and went into seclusion for his last four years. He was, at this time, now Babaji. And so for four years, he just, he said he, he, he said he was having paralysis, so he didn't want to be disturbed. And so for those four years, just chanting, he was in Samadhi. And so when he left his body in Puri, he was brought back here. Well, then there's a famous story of Bishuk Singh. Now, you know the story. He was this first-class demon. He had long hair, big locks, and uh, he was a disheveled kind of person, but he, he was impersonating Ma, Ma Vishnu. And so the villagers were scared of this guy because he had great powers. He could do many unusual tricks. And Prabhupada warned about that. He says, you know, I don't do any magic, but look what we have. We have the greatest magician in the world, Srila Prabhupada. He transformed all our lives. So anyway, this Vishuk Singh uh, was having relations with all the married women in that town. They were afraid they couldn't do anything about it. So neighboring towns complained about it. They didn't want that to happen in their town. But this guy was gaining power and it was increasing all over that area. And so the same thing happened just some recently years back in Vrindavan. There was a guy who looked like a very greasy looking Indian, American Indian. Uh, I don't know if I should mention his name, Kripalu. And so at any rate, he had a big following and had a big, huge opening in this black box. And then he had a big, huge uh, bhakti dam. Anyway, he, he began the same way, doing the same thing in Vrindavan. And the Brahmins were so upset, man, they threw him out of the town. And he comes back later and he built this gigantic huge complex, all done in marble. And so the marble was by expensive marble cutting machines from Italy. They could transform a, a sculpture into marble in two days, completely by, by 
computer, a pantographic rendition in marble. And so anyway, he was doing, they, they, they bought all this marble from Carrara, and he bought a mine there, and he transformed it into places. And there was a takeoff from our, our Samadhi for Seal Prop in Vrindavan, which was all marble. He wanted to make something much bigger, so he did. Sorry about that. In any case, uh, this Vic Vic Sain uh, was doing this, and ultimately Bhaktivinoda goes to his place. And so very politely he came in dressed in karmi clothes. And so he says, well, you're a big person. Why don't you come to Puri and worship Lord Jagannath directly? He says, why should I go to Puri? When I'm Lord Jagannath, I'm Mahavishnu, Vishnu, so why should I go anywhere? You should all come here and worship me. So this is all that he could handle. Bhaktivinoda grabbed him, they handcuffed him and took him to prison. And so when he was in court, um, then the whole story begins about the powers that he had, because he had long hair. And yogis, some people understood that's where the power is, like uh, Samson Delilah. In any case, so the guy's going through a 20-period imprisonment you know, in Puri. And uh, during that time, Bhaktivinoda's family got sick and the daughter almost died. Bhaktivinoda himself almost died because of this, the potency this guy had about creating mischief. So all these fevers were taking place and people around the area. Also, they were being affected by this, by this guy. And he was fasting for 20 days. And so no water and no food for all the time increased his powers to a high point. And so Bhaktivinoda, in a court, sentenced him to justice, and ultimately a British officer came up behind him with scissors and cut, cut his hair. And so as soon as his hair was cut, he fell to the floor and lost all his energy. And so when that happened, all his followers, the courtroom was full of his followers, this guy's followers. So big demons have big entourages. Anyway, they all left. They see the guy only have power in his hair. So when the hair is cut, so that's why we shave up. No, we don't keep the hair, because there's a good reason. And Prabhupada said once to one lady, I think Chicago, and she asked, she looked, uh, Swami, why, uh, why do you shave your head? And he asked, why do you shave your legs? Now that's really hilarious, because better a cool head than cold legs. So she didn't quite pick up, and then they laughed after. So Prabhupada gave us a reason. I mean, if you grow your long hair, I'm going back to America, so I'm keeping mine for a while. Ultimately, I have to visit with my relatives, and they don't like shaved head. In any case, I'll shave it up. So the guy practically died. He did die. He ultimately, Bishop Sena died, you know, shortly after that. And then, uh, and that was the end of that story. And so, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta mentions that that, that, uh, uh, let me write it. Two things, that Gadadhar Pandit and his father are one and the same, the same energy, the same personality. He says that Gorky Shore was also Surabdhamadhar, so these predictions came right from Bhakti, and Bhakti Siddhartha Saraswati. And also that, uh, um, Oh, yeah, it was just that Kamala Manjari is his spiritual, he's part of Lolita's entourage and, and uh, Rupa Manjari. So we come in a long line, nice disciplic succession, and Bhakti noted at the time he was writing, there was nobody else. Nobody understood anything about Lord Chaitanya. And so there were no books and it was just practically unknown here in Bengal. And so what a few people in Calcutta who are scholars, they knew. But ultimately, he had to revive this whole, the, the, all these bells and all these different groups that were like anti vaishnav They were prominent, and so the prominence of all these different occults was very strong. So he had to work so hard to reestablish Vaishnavism. And so here he is, coming out of nowhere, you know, just a court judge, and suddenly he takes to Lord Chaitanya's mercy. And he got CC, and that completely transformed his whole mentality. He started thinking, it's amazing that here is a personality, Gadadhar Pandit, and had to go through all this. And Prabhupada, in his 
early activity and established in this movement was so filled with auster austerities and, and difficulties. And so for us to have to follow in the pattern of these great saints, whatever we do is nothing compared to what they, they had to transpire through. And so, and so uh, whatever we do in this lifetime, anyway, we can glorify them and glorify them the whole mission and chant and preach and establish it all over the world is to our benefit and ultimately the benefit of all those we preach to. Now even when there's no preaching done, like in, in Prabhupada one time in Conway Hall, they had, they had rented this big hall and they had advertised it in England, in London, but nobody came. And so Prabhupada said, even if you're preaching to the walls, ultimately the walls will be transformed stone actually can be transformed and that's what happened in the preaching that there's a prediction by by uh, Nostradamus that personality will come and his preaching will break the stones and but be so sweet that it'll be soft nectar for the ears of the devotees that, and so he talked about uh, two things about Lord Chaitanya's coming 500 years because he was contemporary at that time he Nostradamus and Lord Chaitanya, contemporaries. Different parts of the world, of course, but they were on the same same time. And so he said, in 500 years, this whole personality will, he's coming out of the East, wearing yellow clothes and turning to blue clothes. And his effulgence will radiate, and his words will reach the entire world. And he also, town and village thing, that everywhere his message will be, be heard. And that a personality will come and he saw that personality in his vision, that he would be carrying a rod, a dunda. He'd be dressed in rose-colored cloth. And his words would be so sweet, it will melt the hearts of the stone-hearted Germans. Be careful if you're a German, because you your heart will have a hard time melting. Anyway, that's what happened in Germany. It's still a problem there in the preaching. And, uh, and so it mentions these two things, that ultimately, uh, that person will come and the preaching will spread all over the world, predicted by Nostradamus 500 years at that time before. So, uh, we're in this amazing line, in simple succession, and Prabhupada's carrying a weight, the entire you know, you know, the connection all the way to Krishna. And so here we are on the other end of it, taking the benefit of this whole line of preaching and everything that they did to establish all the pioneers in our movement also. The austerities and the difficulties that, that each person had to have, had to confront. And uh, I remember in the early days in Vrindavan and also in Los Angeles, it wasn't easy. And one time I, I was a brand new devotee and I asked, I was told a proper new ESP, extrasensory perception, I might have mentioned this. But uh, I wanted to find out. So in my mind, and Prabhupada was standing right in front of me. I said, Srila, in my mind, I'm saying this. Srila Prabhupada, you know, I don't understand. I've been with artists and people all my life, you know, different groups, and I've never had the problems I'm having here. Cutthroat, backbiting, criticism, arguing, and just so much disagreement and just, you know, controversy. I thought I joined a religious organization. He turned around, looked at me, smiled. <laughs> He gave a nod that he heard. And just wait, you'll see. And so two weeks later, I found out that nobody was chanting the rounds. There were five big leaders at that time in L.A. None of them were chanting. They had their beat bag as a hand warmer. And so ultimately chanting, if you're in a big position and you're just uh, in that position and all you know how to do is say no, ultimately you got trouble. If you're not chanting, not following the program, you have no right to be in a position. So leadership means that your first position is to be a, a student and a, a, a first-class devotee. Ultimately, you have no position at, at all. Other than that, whatever we do, it's all based on our sadhana. The sadhana is strong. Ultimately, we can do anything. And so that's, that's already brought, borne out in the fruit of the whole movement. And amazing things have happened. Miracles took place. And I talked to Sarab at that time. We were here in Mayapur building the Samadhi. And so at that time, it was like, you know, just an empty field. And so the key to success, he said, 
I never took any money. And so that's the answer. If you take even a drop of this, one story. See what Prophet is up in, upstairs uh, in his room. And he went to the end or end looking towards the gate. And he saw this devotee, Sinyasi, walking out with an attache case. And he, really, he shouted, stop that, stop that man, stop him. And so Tapamoya told me the story. So he ran all the way out, up the road, all the way to the gate. He grabbed a hold of the attache case and it opened up and it opened up. There was hundreds of dollars of bills there. It was packed full of money. So here was a sannyasi running out with big, huge amounts of money. He can't do it. And I've talked to this in class in Vrindavan so many times. I was 37 years in Vrindavan. I saw all these village boys coming to Vrindavan, you know, poor with nothing, hardly any money at all, to even buy a cloth, given everything. And pretty soon, within a few months, they got a Rolex. They got silk cloth, they're driving a car, they're going out collecting, and who knows how much money was, is given from the collection, but ultimately it wasn't all going. And they all have bank accounts. Now, brahmacharis with bank accounts is just unbelievable. And so there's no reason for it. Ultimately, you give everything to the Lord. When I joined, we go out and sink, I set a record of back to Godheads in one day. I was told you can't let anybody go by. You give everybody a book, otherwise they lose the opportunity for millions of years because of the in-breath of Lord Vishnu. Wow. I was okay. So I, they'd be coming down the street in San Diego, they're like 10 across. I give everybody a book, back to Godhead. Then they would walk by, I give the next group another book, 10 at a time. Then I go back to the first group and collect the money. Then I go to the second group and then on and on, not like that. But I set a record for that day. <laughs> in any case, that's the key, that, that if somebody doesn't get the message in this lifetime, they go into the in-breath of Ma Vishnu. That's millions of years. To never see the light, they'll miss the whole 10,000 golden years of this moment of Lord Chaitanya's mercy. And so who knows what happens in the next life. So millions of years again, they come out in the out-breath and take up right up where they left off, as a dog, as a cockroach, whatever it might be. So. When you preach to your friends, you might tell them about that. You know, in your next life, you might be a cockroach. And if you're eating meat and talk, I gotta tell my friends that. I'm going back shortly to America. I gotta confront all these people who are my friends who are eating meat and getting intoxicated. They have no idea what they're doing. So the, the ramifications are so heavy that take a birth of every hair in the back of the animal they ate. So that means millions of lifetimes in the animal body. And that's why there's so much slaughter of cows, because they've taken, it goes on and on, repetitive. And so the bottom line here is that we follow in the pathway of the Acharya, like Bhaktivinoda, who set an example in his lifestyle, and how easy it was for him to go through his daily activities and still chant, keep a sadhana, and we do the same thing. And so early morning practice, Prabhupada gave us a sandwich. And so if we follow that, ultimately we go back home, back to Godhead. The door's open. There's a big opportunity there. It's three quarters bigger, so it means that ISKCON in the spiritual world is three times bigger. There's gonna be a wonderful opportunity there to associate with all these God brothers and sisters. And so when we pass away, it's a wonderful thing. And I've seen in Vrindavan, those that came and passed away with a smile on their face. You know, then there's one devotee, the sannyas from France, the only sannyas Prabhupada made in France. He went away, he got lost, got intoxicated, degraded, but he was in a coma for 30 days. And so at the end, he was just about to leave the body. All these doctors are around him. And suddenly he wakes up. He says, Srila Prabhupada, you've come. He dies. He goes back and leaves the body. So that's what Prabhupada meant. I'll come back for all of you. If you're a devotee, you're chanting your 16 rounds, following the four regular principles, I'm obliged to take you back home, back to Godhead. Srila Prabhupada, ki jai, go, Premanandi, hari hari go. Any questions? Any, anybody disagree? Prabhu, you disagree? <laughs> no questions? There's a question. Don't leave yet. we got some questions. Right, go, if you got to go, no problem, sleep. Sorry. I hope I can get this question together correctly. Uh, I was just reading something in the Bhagavatam. 
he was describing how um, she, in relation to Krishna, there's someone is like Shiva is, I know Vishnu is 94% of qualities, Brahma is 84, I don't, I forgot the exact percentage, but you know what I'm talking about. And then the... You're talking about the qualities of all these different personalities and yeah, how they relate. With Kush, with uh, Vishnu. And then Prabhupada says that if one wants to enter the spiritual world, he has to reach like 78% well, or something like that. Otherwise, the fallen conditions, souls are low percentage. Well, that's a lifetime study. What you're asking is going to take a couple of days to answer. But if you... If you know one thing, that ultimately, if you're following this program, that's the real key. That if you're following a program set, set up by Srila Prabhupada, if you're following it, you're connected to the whole line. You're connected to Vishnu, you're connected to Shiva, you're connected to everybody, all the demigods. And Prabhupada said this spiritual master is sum total of all the demigods. They're all in, encountered and incorporated within the spiritual master. And so here we are. At one time we asked Prabhupada in Los Angeles, the fate, we asked about what, how Lord Brahma looked. And he's aged, so he said, you got a beard? He's 52, he's having his dinner right now, so don't disturb him. If you want to know more, ask him, as if we had access to Lord Brahma. And so he said, you know, I, I've mentioned this. He says, you know, why should I talk to the constable when I can talk to the prime minister? So figure that one out. In other words, he had access to Krishna. Why should he talk to Lord Brahma? Shiva Prabhupada Ki Jai Go Pramanandi. I hope that answers to give you. But there's more, just un unlimited, you know. Aribo.